Who should I? Well, we'll see. <laughs> I, I'm going to listen. So you're, <laughs> you're in. Listen. Yeah, you're in Romania. Yes. Yes, I would say that for Mike because Mike is uh, Mike is comparing tonight. But I am introducing the whole thing, which I'm about to do now. Are we ready, Julio? Ah. Ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, and assembled company, wherever you are in this world and whatever time it is, welcome to the World Storytelling Cafe. And tonight we are working in conjunction with Get a Word in Edgeways. And we have from Getting a Word in Edgeway, Edgeways, Edgeways, our compare from tonight, Mr. Mike Rust. Who will Thank be calling you to the to the plate, so to speak? <laughs> right. Thank you very much for coming from whichever part of the planet you're on. Um, if you want to tell a story, sing a song, to tell a poem, or anything else, would you just wave your hand? Ina, are you going to have a go? Right. Okay. Fine. We've got plenty of time and plenty of, and plenty of patience. So I'm going to start off by telling a little bit about the story. While Zah Zava, Zava, was how do uh, you you're muted, my friend, at the moment. It is Zahra, Zahra. Zahra, yes. Zahra, yes, which is from Iran. Uh, Iran. I was going to say if I got the wrong one with you, I'd be well <laughs> trouble. Okay, would you go first for me? Well, I have. I'll give you a couple of seconds just to get yourself ready. Okay. Get a word in Edgeways is a storytelling festival of, and poetry festival in Shropshire in England, which is, if you think of England and Wales, it's halfway up, but on the English side, what we call the Welsh Marsh. And Marsh is an old, old French word, Anglo-Saxon word for boundary. Um, we've been here for many years telling stories and we're looking to have a field festival in 2021. And part of what we're trying to do is get as many people like you who I'm looking at to come to it. Now at the festival there'll be plenty of time and plenty of places for you to do what you're famous for. So I'm going to go to Zahra first. Is that the right pronunciation or close enough? Close enough. And David, I'm going to... Yeah, and David Thompson, I'm going to come to you second, and after that, I'm going to go to Colin. Okay, so Zara, please get started. This story is a journey. It is a journey from somewhere far to somewhere near. Somewhere so close, somewhere within within us, inside. Do you know where we are? We are in the eighth century. We are in Baghdad. Baghdad. Bagh meaning God, Dad meaning given. Given by God. Baghdad, once named the city of peace, Madina to Salam, once known as Babylon, the pride of Mesopotamia, once shown as Tisfun, the capital of ancient Iran. Yes, we are in Baghdad, where the Karche River rises through the Zagros Mountains, passes through Susa, falling into the Tigris and reaches Baghdad. We are in the round city of Baghdad, where it shelters the house of wisdom, the major center of learning in the world at the time. It was in this city, it was in this city when a man fell in love with a woman. Mard the poet says, the man's heart slipped through his hand and he fell in love. The man lived on one side of the city and the woman lived on the other side of the city. Between them was the rough river of Tigris. 
مرد دل از کف بداد The man was drunk with, with love He was enlightened He was elevated by love Every evening He swam the rough and violent river of Tigris In order to reach and to be united with a woman He swam that river fearlessly courageously one night two nights three nights five nights seven nights many nights many more nights visits as such lasted for a good while wine poetry jasmine's flowers orange blossoms rose water the moon the stars music and song چون بر این حال مدتی بگذشت آتش عشق اندکی کم گشت little by little drop by drop leaf by leaf pace by pace breath by breath their love faded away the poet says the man saw himself right in the middle between him and her his ego gained life and the light was blocked the magic was gone the strength diminished the love disappeared one evening like all the other evenings the man visited the woman as he was eating the nice saffron rice the juicy meat the rarest herbs the thickest yogurt as he was eating the melon as he was eating the fresh white walnuts. It was as if he wasn't tasting any of that at all. Because in his mind, in his mind, he was re- waiting. He was searching for reasons to be difficult. He turned to the woman and said, woman, I see a mole on your face. It hadn't been there before. When did it appear there? The woman replied, you ask me of my mole. I ask you of your love. You ask me of my mole. I ask you of your love. Man, I beg you, whatever you do tonight, do not swim back in the river, back to your house. This mole has been on my face ever since I was born. I am shocked you're noticing it only now. The man laughed out loud. Oh, woman, don't you worry. I know this river so well. I know it inside out. I've been swimming in this river twice every night. The woman insisted and persisted. The man rejected and neglected. The man said farewell to the woman and left. He swam in the rough river of Tigris and the rough river of Tigris swallowed him up. The man died and drowned. Do you know where we are? We are somewhere deep, somewhere deep within us. I mean inner life, where there is magic, where there is power, where there is strength, patience, where there is love. Hold on to it, value it. Don't let it fade away with time.
That is a lovely story, especially for this time, Sarah. That is beautiful. Right, so going on, we said David next, and then Colin, and then the person after that would be Rosalind. So David, over to you. I'm not at the bottom. My name is David Dante. I live in Dante. Dad told me by long, long ago. Born by when that Eva. Eva the go king. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. That was very well done, and I know you've tried and worked on it very hard. And we came over to you next, Colin, and after Colin will be Rosalind, and after Rosalind we will go to Jody Lee, who I believe is the poet. Yeah. Okay, so the order is going to be Colin, Rosalind, and then Jody. Okay. Okay, I think I'm on mute. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, uh, thanks very much, David, for that. Very well done. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try it? a wee song. Oh, I'm gonna try a wee song this week. I had, I had a story in my head, but uh, this wee song has been coming in and out of my head all, all day. Um, You'll you'll all know it's a quite a quite a harrowing <laughs> memory that song came from. You know that you remember the little lad from um, Syria 
who his anniversary was just just a couple of months ago at the end of the summer there he was he was washed up on a on a, a beach in uh, in uh, Turkey um, about five years ago his name was Aylan Shenu he gets called various things but the closest I can get to his name is Aylan Shenu and he was from from Syria and, and along with his family he was he was trying to cross. Uh, uh, to, of course, to get, try and get to Germany is where, where they were ultimately heading, and from there they were hoping to go to Canada uh, to meet up with other uh, family members. However, uh, obviously it didn't uh, end very well for that family, and uh, as it doesn't for 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 very very many of them, and it, and it's an ongoing thing. And it seems to me when I when I saw that and I thought about it afterwards, it seemed to me that it's been going on since I was a kid. And uh, anyway, this is my kind of take on it. There's a wee song I, I wrote uh, a while back called Boat People, and it's in memory of uh, Island uh, Shenu. Like a message in a bottle. Washed up on the sand Little boy from Syria Never made the promised land Looked like he could be sleeping So peacefully he lay Dressed like one of my kids On a summer holiday I hold my loved ones closer The way anxious parents do I can watch the TV pictures Of the dread of deja vu When I close my eyes I think Of all that's gone before I see a million desperate people Making for a distant shore I was too young in the 70s To understand why vaguely me as boat people Were on the news at 10 The world has changed a lot since then but I still find it hard to comprehend why both people are on the news again. Way back in the olden days, they called them coffin ships. They filled them to the gunnels with Irish immigrants from a hundred different nations. For America they left The hungry, the persecuted The poor and dispossessed I was too young in the 70s To understand why Vietnamese boat people Were on the news world has changed a lot since then But I find it hard to comprehend Why both people are on the news again Now they're drifting in the darkness Hearts beating in their throats Their odds are 50-50 In a thing that barely floats for the half who never make it Someone might say a prayer But that little boy from Syria Made the whole world stop and stare I was too young in the 70s To understand why Vietnamese boat people Were on the news world has changed a lot since then 
I find it hard to comprehend why both people are on the news again. I was too young in the 70s to understand why Vietnamese both people were on the news. world has changed a lot since then, but I find it hard to comprehend why both people are on the news again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colin. That's great. I just people we I just wish people would remember all the time that all the people who want to come to my country, which is the UK, and the British and Irish Isles as we call it nowadays, they want to come here because they want to work and they want a better life. And I've always tried to do that in my life. So we've gone from Colin to the the, the the batting order now is going to be Rosalind, Joby, Esther, Teresa, Ina and Jill. Now, I'll give you plenty of time to count it out. So we're going to Rosalind, and after Rosalind will be Jodie. Okay, Rosalind? You've got to unmute yourself, mate. Okay. Right, uh, what I'm going to tell you this evening is a, a story that I wrote for Halloween, actually, and it's called Lamp Post, A Haunting. Night. Rain. Skid. That almost! What was close? Scorched rubber, shattered glass, crumpled metal, a barking dog, a dancing leaf, spilt, dripping, dark, silence, time, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, dandelion clock, chime, light. Where am I? I, I just need to, if I can, has anyone, is there anybody there? Wind ripples on a puddle right by my eye, bending the light into little yellow waves. Tarmac on my tongue. That lamppost shouldn't be so close. So tired, so heavy, dark. Time. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Dandelion clock, chime, light. Where, where am I? Am I? can't make out, I, I can't feel my, can't feel. Big dog sniffing around, he hasn't seen me yet. Here, here boy, hasn't heard me. I, if I can just get, he must be with someone. Hello, over here, I, I need, oh, he's gone. I could almost have touched him. Rain, rain, need to find, need to get to, chilled to the bone. Bone, bones. What bones? I can't feel any, can't hear. Muted sound, mouthful of earth. How long have I been here? Dark light, dark light, day, night, day, night, day, night, light. Where am I? I, I, I thought, I mean, some, somebody, surely somebody must have, haven't they? What's that? Something on the lamppost? Flowers? Something written, in, fading, falling, loving, shriveled, gone. There's that dog again. Hello? Oh, he's gone. Just how long have I been here? Dark. Light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, light. Day, night, day, night, day, night, day, night. Light, wide sky, oyster grey, azure, lilac, rose, flame, indigo, black. Indigo, flame, rose, lilac, azure, turquoise, amethyst, magenta, orange, black. Red, flame, blush, blue, salmon, orange, red, black. Red, blue, black, red, blue, black, red, blue, black, blue, black, blue. Starlings, swallows, pigeons, winking on and off like strings of black fairy lights, swooping in swathes and swags across the sky like tea leaves in a cup. Clouds, moon, sun, stars, sweeping the heavens, dipping and waltzing, curtsying and giddying perpetual motion. Time and tide, ebbing and flowing, waxing and waning, bloating and draining. 
dark. Swimming against the current, struggling upward, ever upward to the air that's never there, no hands, tapering to a tail like an eel, like a sperm, like a shooting star, brief and bright, high-pitched whine and whistle, whistle up the wind. Time. Dandelion clock, chime, light. Well, where am I? Where, where am I? Hello? Is, is there anybody there? Can, can you hear me? For God's sake, is somebody coming? Plum blossom. Plums lying all over the ground. Someone should shoveled. Gone. Plum stones. Leaves falling, branches bare. I've seen that dog before. The wind is, is cutting right through me, but... But I can't feel, I, I don't feel, well, I, I feel kind of spread, spilled, seeping into the ground. I, I, I'll, I'll just climb up and wrap myself around this lamppost while I wait. How long have I been here? Dark. Time. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, dandelion clock, chime. Light. Hello, please. I've, I've been waiting. Someone, anyone, is, is there anybody there? I, I can't make out. Just shadow puppets, shades, filing past in rapid slow motion, like the flick of a brush, smudges, stains, jerking, flickering like a children's flip book, packets of charcoal lines stuttering along like the silhouetted slough husks of stick insects, a kaleidoscope of grey and black shards, that dog, I, I'm sure. God's name, how long have I been here? Dark. Time. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Dandelion clock. Chime. Light. Rain, 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 squall, whipping up the leaves and gravel, snatched up and running down the street as if their lives depended on it. Downpour, descending in buckets, lashing at the lamppost like a glass beaded cat and nine tails, pouring right through me, soaked, drenched to the... The whole world caught, reflected upside down in a raindrop hanging from a twig. Winter worn, wind torn town. Same big dog again. Does he see me through the curtain? So how long have I been here? I, I, I can't. Dark. Light, dark, light, dark, light, day, night, day, night, day, night, day, night. Sun, shoot, sprout, leaves that dog. Stem, milk thistle, buds, flowers. That dog, down, wafted away on the wind and gone. That dog again. Day, night. Day, night, day, night, day, night, day, night, day, night. Snowflakes spinning, tumbling, drifting down, settling. Winter white, silent blanket. Headlights winking in the crystal crust of a snowdrift. Melting, slush, mud, footprints. I'm disappearing into the background. Blurring, 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 unraveling. Raggedy edges, wearing thin, moth-eaten, threadbare. Haven't I seen that dog before? How long have I been here? Dream. Seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, pages torn from the calendar, faded photographs, unspooled cassettes, water swirling down the plug hole. Milky Way whirling the sickening salad spinner, children's tin music box roundabout royal of the stars, wild, slow, centrifugal dance. Day night, day night, day night, day night, day night, dark light, dark light, dark light, dark time. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, dandelion clock, chime, night, rain, light, skid. Ah, it was coming right at me. I don't know who it missed it. It, it could have. Oh, hello, someone at last. <sighs> That's very, very good. Thank you very much. And you did that. Welcome, welcome. Yeah, yeah. Thank you.
Right, we're going to Jody next, and then to Esther, and after Esther will be Teresa. So, Jody. Hello. Uh, may I just ask quickly, Mike, before you mute yourself, yeah. how much time I've got? So I'd like to do two poems, if that's okay. But I see there's a lot of people on, so I didn't want to. Um... Well, I'm looking for something around eight to ten minutes, but no more Ooh. than that. Yeah, that's, that's okay. okay. They're they're about four minutes each. So now I'll I will see. be timing, and if you go on over twelve minutes, I want I need a note from your doctor. <laughs> <laughs> it's I'll called make verbal. Sure I have them. <laughs> it's called verbal diarrhea, and we've all got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well I'll get straight to it. Fill these in. Uh, right, we'll I go hope... for two poems then, and then we're going to Esther after. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I haven't performed this one for a little while, so I'm going to have to read it from me book. Uh, this poem is called uh, Waiting for My Cue. I once queued for two hours just to ride a roller coaster. And I wouldn't really have minded, but in two minutes, it was over. It was all up and down and round and round. Then I was sent off on my way. You've had your bit of fun, my son. Now get on with your day. And I was left feeling a bit bewildered. See, my two brothers and I had queued so long to take that ride, to feel the thrills, the lows, the highs, and in the blink of an eye, it went by. And I remember thinking, this is just like life. It's a very familiar story. See, we all seek the highs, we all want the ride, but the rest is seen as boring. So I thought back to that queue and those slow two hours waiting. See, when we first arrived, it was all anticipating. It was all excitement, electrified. It was all, we're finally in the line. But it wasn't long before we realized we were gonna be there for some time. So we stood there, stoic, silent, searching eyes while no one spoke, which isn't too unusual because we are all manly blokes. We often stand there silent with a odd nod to each other, but that never lasts too long because we're not just blokes, we're brothers. So the middle one leans in and says, I've just farted, and then laughs. The young one pulls a face, retreats a pace, that seems to break the ice. I say, Jordan, the middle one, you couldn't have waited until we got on. He said, dude, I'm worried if I'd done it on there, that more would come out of my bum. Huh, brothers. See, we've grown. When we're alone, we're men. But when we get together, we're like little kids again. And we're all smiling, proud, like idiots now. Smiling and laughing, which is smiling really loud. There's some disapproving looks, some smirks. Most people just don't care. They all feel much the way we do. Just tired of waiting there. Then we start to stare as people do when stuck for long waits in long queues, except there isn't much to look at save the roller coaster's build. But that just raises safety questions. And the fact we could be killed. I mean, it's unlikely, highly unlikely, but once thought, that thought won't stop. For when you see the reality of this ride, what prevents it is not a lot. It's not the metal or the nuts and bolts that put its integrity in question, but the staff are the ones who make sure it's safe and they don't give off that impression. Still, after accepting our mortality and saying it's worth the risk, Deciding that dying made it more exciting says much about how we three tick. Then the young, the young brother then leans in and cheekily says, did you see the size of that girl's breasts? To which I reply, dude, you should not objectify women like that. They didn't struggle against patriarchal rule. So some prat could go up and drool. They deserve to be respected for all they have endured. Imagine if mum saw this behavior, she would hit you with the book. Then as I climbed down off my high horse, of course I take a look and he was right, they were impressive and I stand by what I said. She, de she deserves a commendation, not for a figure, but more for her back strength. See, the thing is, we pass those slow lived hours, laughing, chatting, interacting, all the little things we let slip by, for in truth, we were connecting. See, it's hard to keep this in our minds while taking part in this wild ride, getting thrown around emotion town in roller coaster life. But I realize more as time goes on, the ride's not all we need. The highs, the lows, the thrills, the spills, the face distorting speed. 
Now, it seems to me that that doesn't mean as much as those parts in between, the gentle curve where we share our words, where people really meet. See, I can't remember that thrilling ride. It was all over far too fast. But the memories of standing in that line, well, those memories will last. Um, right, I'd like to do another poem now. I was going to do this last time. Thank you very much, but didn't get a chance. I really like performing this poem. I'll get straight to it. The, Nick, the title's a bit tongue in cheek, so forgive me. I do like to add a bit of a cheeky humour in. It's called While You're Down There, Mother Nature. This poem's about our fair earth and its mother. It's a mother we've scorned, though most claim to love her. Hell have no fury like a woman scorned. That's a phrase that's ingrained in us, so it can't be wrong. But a true woman's nature is to nurture, not scorn. From knowledge of inception to the moment we're born, she adorns us with love. She protects us from storms. She collects in her arms, gives us strength to go on when we're warm. See, between nurture and murder is a definitive line. It's a Great Wall of china size type of divider. And it's fair to say in the sexes, the female's finer. And as women go, there's no woman diviner than mum. Mama, man, mum or mother, no other could so unconditionally love you. No other could so molly coddle or smother. No other could see through your flaws and still love you. No other. No mother could watch as her small children suffer. No mother could watch sons, daughters slaughter each other. No mother could bring down the hammer of violence upon you. Except one, our mother. Our great mother earth, who's been stricken and sickened, poisoned and perverse. Now she's lashing out with all the force she can muster. This mother who holds us may turn to a monster. And how dare you, Mother Nature? How dare you? Oh, sorry. How dare you, Mother Nature? How dare you lash out? How dare you come crashing down, smashing our towns, taking homes in the foam of your ocean, bringing death scythe alive with the mountain's mudslide, run and hide. Because Mother Nature, she's pissed. But hear this, Mother Nature, your volcanoes may hiss, but we'll frack you right back to the Stone Age, you bitch. Hmm. Now I know a thousand graves not worth, uh, I know a wave's not worth a thousand graves. But some might say, what did you expect? If you had me round the neck, I too would push back. I too would kick out. I would send a cloud filled with charged electrons of such terrifying proportions that you would ask yourself if perhaps you went too far. And maybe amidst the stars, another planet sits, ravaged, damaged, its welfare mismanaged until it screams, no more. And when this earth is scorched, when the buildings hit the floor, when the waves and the winds come down more and more and more, then will we ask, what for? For comfort, progression, for greed's great allure. Because if you ask people of New Orleans or the Philippines, I'm sure they will tell you there is no comfort there. No comfort in the cries of a country's despair. When the air is thick with ash and the lava comes splashing, subtracting our petty man-made monuments to nothing. Her once loving moments will seem like a dream. Her floor will be shaking. Her storms will be cracking. Her winds will be howling, a banshee's brash breeze. And us on our knees, hands crushed white with pleas. Tears on our cheeks as we beg her to cease. See, in her eyes, we may seem just like a disease and some may agree, but me? I'm not so sure. She is sore as she sounds when her ground's torn asunder, as loud as she cries when her skies scream with thunder, when she has a tectonic moan and her bones groan from under, when the land turns to sand and she raises her hand and the plates which she served on don't shift, no, they slam. I'll be damned if I'm damned to miss out on that dance. A pock of bloody lipstick, baby. The chance of a lifetime. The end of our lifeline. See, I am proof that humanity is not a disease. Because you know what? I say, bring it on, Mother Nature. As sad as it may be, you've earned that one, Mum. You can do as you please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jodie. That's very good. Very, very See you in a fortnight. Thank or, you. Okay.
<laughs> right, so we're going to Esther and then Teresa and then Ina afterwards. So we'll go to Esther now. And so Esther, you, you were in... Um, I'm in Spain. You're in Spain, yes. Yeah. Which part of Spain? In Barcelona. So you're still locked down, are you? Um, sort of. We're allowed to go outside for walks and exercise, but you're not allowed to do any activities. Right. Well, that's really good for us. That means you've got to stay inside and tell us a story. <laughs> <laughs> it does mean that I've been writing a lot, so it right. is good. Okay, well, great. We're looking forward to it. Thank you. Am I good to go? Yep. All right. Well, my story actually happens in Australia because I spent a couple of years there and I was very touched by Aboriginal culture. So I thought I'd just pop one out there for them. So the three sisters with in the Blue Mountains in Katoomba, in the Jameson Valley, there were three sisters. Their names were Mini, Gunadu and Wimala. Now they say that bad things come in threes. So if you find yourself in a three, be careful. And the three sisters, they went out with their father, Tia One. Their father was a witch doctor. And during the Aboriginal dream time, when everything was created, the spirits gave to each tribe the necessary tools and land so they could survive. So the witch doctor, their father, he carried a magic bone. Now in the Jameson Valley, there's a great big hole. And you should never cross that hole if you don't want to cross paths with the bunyip, a monstrous creature with a big round head, an elongated neck like a giraffe, and a huge body. They say it is like an ox or a hippopotamus. So no. You don't want to cross paths with him and you do not want to fall into that hole. The father took his three daughters for a walk and he was going in search of food. But he knew of the dangers of this bunyip. So he left his three daughters on a cliff behind a rocky wall for surely there they would be safe. And he said to his daughters, you stay here and you wait for me. And of course, they obeyed and they said, yes, Father, yes, we will wait here. So they stayed on the cliff, chatting and giggling and doing things that girls do. And they were waiting for their father. Now, the father, he descended down the stairs and he went off into the forest to look for the food. And he crossed that hole. And he was careful. The bunyip did not come out. But whilst he was walking, the three sisters on the cliff top, the youngest one, Mini, she screamed, Ah! For a snake had appeared in front of her. And we all know that some of the most dangerous animals in the world actually reside in Australia. So when a black snake comes before you, I think you'd scream too. And Mini, she picked up a rock and she threw it at the snake but she didn't think about her actions. And the rock, it went over the edge of the cliff and it fell and it fell and it fell and it carried on its journey. And it went straight into the bunyip's hole. <sighs> now in the valley, which is made of sandstone cliffs, they say that when the soil underneath interacts with water, it, ro it erodes and the cliff falls down. But I believe there is another version of that. When the bunyip is angered, he roars like a lion and it sends something similar to an earthquake through the valley, making everything shake. So the bunyip, disturbed by the rock that had been thrown into his hole, how dare somebody throw a rock into my home? He got up and he went out of his hole to see what was going on. And he went up the cliff and there, yes, the three sisters, now because of the giant roar and the earthquake, the cliff had been separated. And the three sisters, they found themselves on the edge of the cliff and the bunyip. The bunyip was very, very happy. I think I might have myself a feast here. 
because the bunyip's diet. Well, it was much richer if you ate women or girls. And so he licked his lips. Mm. But the father, the father was down in the forest and he'd heard all this ruckus and he'd come running to their savior. And he got his magic bone and he, he cast it upon the three daughters and he turned them into stone to save them from the bunyip. The three sisters were rock formations. And the bunyip was very, very angry. And he turned upon the father and he started the chase. And the father, the tier one, the, the witch doctor, sorry, he ran off into the forest and he was going left and right and down the river and up the side of the cliff. And before too long, he realized that he had no escape route. And so with his magic bone, he turned himself into a leer bird and flew off into the sky. And the bunyip let out a giant roar. Rawr! His first loss, the three sisters, which would have been such a delicious meal. But then he had the witch doctor, the father. Well, this will do. But no, the witch doctor was gone, the leer bird. And the bunyip, he stormed back to his hole and he went inside his hole and there, were, sure enough, was the rock that the sister had thrown. And he tossed it to one side and he sat in his hole. The leobot, tier one, the father, he flew around the valley and he went back to the, his place of transformation. And he, he looked for the magic bone and it wasn't there. And he lifted up one wing and it wasn't there. And he lifted up the other wing. Still no magic bone. And to this day, the Leobert, tier one, their father, he has not found his magic bone. And he continues to be a Leobert. And those three sisters are sitting on the edge of Kotumba, looking over the valley, the Jameson Valley, as the three stones of Mini, Gunadu, and Wimala. So if you get the chance to visit Kotumba in the Blue Mountains and you hear the song of the Leobot, then know that it is the father, the witch doctor, Tia Wan, and the three sisters. Oh. Thank you. That was lovely. Thank you very much. I know a lovely story from Cornwall about three standing stones, but I've never heard that one before, and I've never been yeah. to Australia. so. Um, I think they've got a set in New Zealand as well. And then I have heard that somewhere in England, there's also three standing stones. So it yes, must just be yeah. a really common theme. Yeah, and there's three standing stones on the north shore of Cornwall, just down river okay. a bit from Padstow is where it is. Well, I'm from Somerset. And I've been to Cornwall a lot. Sin Mother Ivy's Bay is the place. It's where okay. the lifeboat is. Nice. Okay, if you, yeah, absolutely. Right, so thank you very much, Esther. We're going to Teresa, and after Teresa, we go to India and then to Jill. So, Teresa. Hi, go. good evening, everyone. Loving the stories and the poems so far. To remind me again where you're from, Teresa. I'm from Northamptonshire. Northamptonshire, right, great. Yeah, and I've got three short ones, if that's, that's all fine. right. That's fine. Okay, the first one. I just need to tell you a little bit of something before I start it. And it's um, a few years ago, I had an opportunity to do some moth surveying with a moth expert who was setting up light boxes to collect them. So this one, first one is called Mothing with Gordon. Brown wooden boxes fitted with light set up at dusk to attract moths in flight. The primitive caddis was found on a tree. The mozzies abound and they try to eat me. We spotted a drinker was how he did sway. His face like a mole on my finger he lay. The brimstone glowed brightly. The footman stood strong. This brings me such passion. Let's stay all night long. The eyed hawk felt settled and veiled his disguise. He rode on my coat sleeve, much to my surprise. Gordon, there's bird poo amongst this disorder. 
No, dear, that's called the discreet clouded border. There's one whose name I can't recall, he looks so like a twig, and smoky wainscot sounds as though I'm at a Motown gig. Hearts and darts, silver wing and single dotted wave, somehow I think I've just become a lepidoptery slave. <laughs> I should say to everybody, and I didn't, and I do apologise, Northamptonshire is one of, it's what's called one of the English shires, and it's about the centre of the country, and it's part of the, the British and Irish Isles. Sorry, Isa, uh, Teresa. <laughs> <laughs> so this one's called Song. The, these next two are new ones. I don't want a sad song. I want a bright song, a funky song. I don't want a blues song, I want a true song, a new song. I want a gentle swaying groove song, a pirouetting move song. I want a sing song, a love song, a lifting up my heart song. I want a nice song, a happy song, not a sentimental claptrap song. I want a great song, a cheery song, an inclusive and upbeat song. I don't want a sad song. I want a stirring, bright-eyed, feel-good song. I don't want a blues song. I want a rainbow-coloured song. Yeah. OK, well, this is my last one. It's called Can You See It? <laughs> Through the avenue of oak came a glimpse. Through the veil of the mist, I saw a twist of something unexpected. Something stirred in my wolf blood veins. I let go of the reins to look at the gains where to others none could be found. I called it a light at the end of the tunnel. Can you see it too? If you do, then speak it, share with those who seek it, bring a different hue to the shades of blue, lift us up through the heights, seeking rights where once were wrongs, putting right the slights of a yesterday coloured in grey. Make a today that's worth living for. The end. Oh. That was lovely, and thank you very much. That was so. How often do you write, do you write your poetry? Well, at the moment, I'm uh, I'm doing workshops with John, so I'm doing a lot of writing at the moment. So right. a couple a week at the moment. Right. But okay. it goes in right. it goes in phases. So uh, earlier in lockdown, I wrote one a day for sixty days. Um, right. And then I had a little bit of a break, and now I'm writing a couple of weeks. So, right. So that's a collection, is what it's called. <laughs> right. Thank you very much. Right. So we go to Ina. Hello. Oh, oh, there you are. Yes. There yes. you go. And you're from Romania. Yes, from the west yeah. of Romania, from Timișoara. So how far are you from the sea? Quite far. <laughs> Quite, quite across quite the right. country, yes. <laughs> right, okay. Right, okay. well, welcome, and I'm looking forward to hear your story. Thank you. Or poem. It's a story. So, um, once upon a time, up on the hilltop, there was a castle. It wasn't a huge or a fancy one. It was a rather small but strong one. It was built from stones with a huge gate beautifully carved in wood and a garden, a secret garden, because the princess who lived in the castle loved flowers and she had a secret garden all to herself, full with roses. She loved roses, all colors, all shapes, all sizes. Every single day, every single moment of her life, she spent with her flowers, tending to her flowers, watering her flowers, talking to her flowers, even singing to them because she loved them so much. They were so beautiful. At the bottom of the hill, there was a small town with small, gray, all crammed together houses with narrow and straight streets. At the other end of the town, there was a huge, dark, greedy factory. Every morning, even before the 
sun was up, the factory with howl, its sirens calling all the people from the town to work. And they would wake up, you know, still tired, still sleepy, with their dreams shattered by the howling sirens of the factory. And they will put on their gray and ugly clothes. And one by one, they will land up. And one by one, they will be swallowed up by the factory. And inside her belly, they would stay all day long working, working really hard. And late in the evening, after the sun was already asleep, another great howling would announce the end of the workday. And the greedy factory would spit the people one by one out of her belly, back on the street, back to their houses, where they would just grab something for dinner and go back to sleep as soon as they could because they were tired and exhausted. The next morning, the same howling would announce another day of work. And so it went on day after day, week after week, month after month, almost the entire round, round the earth. Until one day, one day a year, the factory was silent. No howling, no growling, no nothing. The people would wake up in the morning, not because of the factory calling them, but because of the sun giving them his light and his warmth. They would be so happy to wake up on their own time. They would put on their best clothes, their nicest clothes, would decorate their houses, and then they would get out in the street. And together as a group, they would go up the hill, up the hill to the castle, chanting, laughing, talking to each other, being joyful without any work. It was the day of joy. Once they were up the hill, the castle gate, they would announce their presence there with cheerful shouting and the princess inside her garden would be already expecting them. And then she would just rush, you know, open the gate and with her arms full of roses, she would offer each one of them from her flowers. Every single person in the town would go down the hill then with a bouquet of roses to have in his house. And the days that followed the day of joy were full of perfume and colors. And the world was a bit more bearable. But as soon as the roses faded away, the same howling and growling, the same hard work, the same tiredness would come over the city. Well, this year was even harder than the years before because there was no rain. And in the tiny little gardens that were behind the tiny little houses, nothing grew, no vegetables, no flowers. The factory grew even greedier and the work was even harder. So the people in the town were tired, exhausted and starving. When the day of joy arrived, when the sun came up, all the sun could see were pale, starved faces and sad, dark eyes. Nobody in the town put their best clothes on. Nobody decorated their houses. They just gathered on the street like a mob, complaining about how hard the life was and that they had enough. They couldn't take it anymore. And they went up the hill. But as they went up the hill, their pain, their hunger transformed into anger. And by the time they reached the gate of the castle, they were shouting with anger and banging the gate for the princess to come out. Why is she late? How can she afford to be late with their flowers? They were expecting their flowers. The princess heard them and she came, you know, with the bouquet, with the bunches of flowers in her arms. But when she opened the gate, what she saw left her mute no joyful faces or eyes, but angry faces, pale faces, and a lot of anger and pain. For a few moments, she stood there petrified. Only one hand, only one hand was enough to reach out and grab some flowers from her arms, tearing her skin. Then many other arms were just grabbing the flowers, even not being aware that her skin was all wounded and bleeding. But it wasn't enough for their anger. They went into the castle, into the gate, into the secret garden, and they torn up all the flowers and they took everything they could take with them. Still wasn't enough to quench their anger. They took the princess down with them, down to the town, and forced her to plant the, the, trousers, the roses she loved so much 
for them. They wanted to have their own beautiful flowers. They didn't want her to offer some of her own. And the princess tried, tried really hard to plant roses in each and every tiny little garden of the town. But she didn't succeed. Every time she planted one, the rose would die. And the anger in people grew even bigger and bigger. No matter how many times the princess tried to explain them that you cannot force beauty. You can only grow beauty inside your walls and then offer it. Thank you. <laughs> That's lovely. I love stories like that. That's brilliant. So I'm going to go to Jill next and then I'm going to go to Rhiannon who's moved on my screen. And so after Jill, Rhiannon, you're going to be up and, and Rhiannon and her dad are going to get their guitars out and play us a tune. Um, before Jill starts, I would like to say we'll be going for about an hour. Um, as, and if anybody hasn't done anything or been asked yet to do anything it wants to do, can you just wave or get me on the chat or something else? We've got plenty of time. And we can certainly have a short break if you want it. Um, and then we can carry on. After Jill, I will be asking for parish notices. Parish notices is where there's things that you want to advertise to the group. So if you've got a gig or you're going to a festival or you're going to a poetry reading or you've been booked to do a gig or whatever, tell us all because we will be interested. So we're going to Jill and then from Jill to Rhiannon. Okay, Jill, who is on the edge of Bodmin Moor, if I remember right. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, and it's sunny there because you're in a different time to, time zone to me and Teresa. <laughs> yeah. That's Cornwell, Teresa. <laughs> oh, it's definitely winter today. Hmm. All right. Hmm. This is a story, an old and very familiar story to most storytellers, but it's my version, and I love it. Mm. There was once a woman called Suriram. She and her husband had been living happily together, a loving married couple for many years, but there were no children. Suriram had always longed to have a daughter a daughter whom she could call Suliram, to whom she could sing the song that her mother used to sing to her, to whom she could tell the story that her mother used to tell. But it never happened. There was no daughter. And as Suliram came to understand there would be no daughter, pushed that song and that story down, down, deep inside her, trying to forget, trying to push that longing away. But in doing that, she hardened her heart. Her relationship with her husband became less loving, colder. One day, it was winter. She had done all the housework, done the cooking, supper was ready, the fire was stoked up, it was dark outside, probably going to snow. And the husband was not yet home from work. Now, that song and that story they didn't want to be pushed down. They didn't want to be hidden, forgotten. So they had made a pact. But when the opportunity arose, they would escape. And this was their opportunity. Because the woman, with nothing more to do but wait for her husband, sat down in the chair beside the fire and dozed. And soon the doze turned into a sleep, and she began to snore, and her mouth dropped open, and the song 
and the story crept out of her mouth, scrambled down to the floor and running across the floor towards the door when they heard the husband stamping snow off his boots as he came up to the door. Quickly, Song turned itself into a soft, warm cloak and hung up on the hook by the door. Story turned into a pair of stout walking boots. Stories do like to travel. And the boots sat themselves underneath the cloak. The husband opened the door and came in, taking off his coat to hang up on the hook. There was a cloak hanging there. He went to take off his boots and there were boots already there. They called Suli Ram, Suli Ram. She woke slowly. Suli Ram, have we got a guest? What, what? No, no guest. Whose cloak, whose boots are these? What, what cloak? I don't know. Oh, I see, he said. It's like that, is it? Where is he? Is he under the bed? If you think that of me, you might as well leave. <laughs> right, I will. And he stormed out, slamming the door behind him. It was dark out there and it was snowing. And he could hardly go to any of the neighbours and say that his wife was hiding a lover under the bed. Uh, there was a ruined chapel at the top of the hill. He might as well go up there, find a corner out of the wind and huddle there for the night. So that's what he did. And up and found the deepest, most sheltered corner he could find. Meanwhile, Suri Ram, he didn't know what to do. He was crying. He didn't feel like eating. Best thing to do was go to bed. So he took the lantern and went to bed. Got into bed and blew out the flame. And as the flames always did every night, it flew out through the window and joined other flames from other cottages as they went up, up the hill to the ruined chapel, where every night they would dance and play and gossip. And this night, Suliram's flame really had something to gossip about. <laughs> she was laughing and saying, you never guess, Suliram's thrown her husband out. <laughs> Yes, he thinks she's got a lover. Yeah, it's not, it's not. It's the story that her mother used to tell, the song that her mother used to sing. <laughs> they tried to escape, but the husband nearly caught them. They had to change into a cloak and boots. <laughs> the husband heard all this and said, Oh, Sully Ram, oh, I didn't understand. I'm so sorry. It was too dark, too heavy with snow for him to go home now. So he waited, tried to sleep, but couldn't. He just sat there in the cold, shivering, awake all night until the light started to dawn. Then he crept out down the hill to the cottage quietly up to the door and opened the door very softly, expecting to find Suliram fast asleep. But she hadn't been able to sleep either. She was up and bustling and getting breakfast ready and not knowing what to do with herself. The husband went up to her. He didn't say anything. He just took her by the hand and led her to the fire and made her sit down on a cushion in front of the fire. Then he went to the door and took down the cloak, picked up the boots, took them to Suliram, placed the boots by her feet, wrapped her in the cloak of song, sat down beside her, laid his head in her lap and said, Suliram, sing me the song your mother used to sing. Tell me the story your mother used to tell. And very slowly, 
Hesitantly, Suriram began. Suriram, Suriram, Ram, Ram, Suriram, Yang Mani, Aduha Indong Suriram, Bijaklasana. And then she began, once upon a time, there was a little girl called Suriram. And when the song had been sung and the story had been told, husband and wife both smiled. They looked at each other and smiled. And there, beside the walking boots of story, and wrapped in the comforting cloak of song, they embraced, relaxed, and fell fast asleep. <clears throat> that was lovely, Jill. Thank you very much. Rhiannon, you, you're on next. Okay. Now, if you look in your device, there should be a blue box at the top. It says, turn off original sound. No, so yeah. I, so Jake's, I, Jake's got, it. got it. Jake's got it. That's fine. Okay, now, where it says Suzanne, it really means Jake, who is dad, Rhiannon and Kerry. Kerry is just off to the left of my picture hiding. I can see you, see? I can see through doors and all sorts of places mm -hmm. I can. Yeah, and Rhiannon, right. who's got, I can see the top of a guitar, which means now oh. we're, the, the music that we do here is nothing to do with folk music. It can be any type of music at all. And so you choose your favorite song okay. and away you go, girl. Okay. Okay, this is an original song called By Your Side. Oh, an original.
that's just fine. Oh, well done, well done. Well done, well done. And we could even hear you through the internet from the top of the Clee Hill. And it was quite clear for once. So you were lucky both ways. <laughs> right. We've come to the parish notices. And after the parish notices, is anybody who hasn't performed who wants to perform who I haven't asked yet? Um, I've got Gary and Keith in particular I'm looking at. John, I think you and I will be next week sometime, mate, unless you particularly want to do one tonight. Um, the parish notices... We all know about the World Storytelling Calf. It's like going to a festival. You get on a Friday evening. you just got to sit there and go through what they're doing and mark out and make sure you get to the right place at the right time. They're doing a wonderful job in the middle of this 2020 pandemic. And I can't, my praises for them can't be high enough. They really can't. Uh, us ourselves, um, we'll get a word in edgeways. We're doing all sorts of things. And it's um, Kasper Sorensen who's doing Taking on the Tradition on the 1st of December next time. And then we are ongoing oh, through December up to Christmas. Has anybody else got anything they want to promote or announce for us? Esther, I can see you. Yep. Um, if anybody's interested, I'm doing a couple of gigs at the end of the month online via Zoom. So one is the storytelling night. It's on Friday the 27th, but obviously it might clash with other events that are already happening, so that's fine. Yeah. And then I'm okay. doing a poetry night on Sunday the 29th. Right. All the details are on up? Facebook. Right. Would you put those up on chat for us now while we're here, yeah. and then people can have a look at them? And I'm sure, are you? Is they, these free events or are they ticketed? Um, they're actually ticketed because I've been doing loads of free stuff throughout the month of um, October and November. Right, so the tickets but are... they're reasonable. There you are. Um, so it's all on that Facebook page. Right, and the tickets are how much? Um, they're two different ones. I think one's six euros for the poetry and the other one is eight Right, that's the very story, reasonable, yeah. I should say. And that's for a couple of hours. So that's a very reasonable price by someone who is very talented. And I'll try and get that. Well, thank you for that comment. Um, I just didn't want to put a stupid price on it because I know it's a really difficult time um, considering, you know, lockdown, COVID and everything else that's going on. So I tried to be quite reasonable with it. Well, there's so much going on online at the moment. It's, it's really difficult to know how to promote it. But uh, well done for having a yeah. go at it. Is anybody else who wants well, thank to? You. No, no. Like... Anybody else who want to promote themselves? I'd like to just flag up a couple of things at the cafe. Okay. The Tuesday night, every Tuesday night at five o'clock, not six, at five o'clock, we have a young international tellers. So if anyone knows any young people at all that would either like to come on, tell a story, sing a song, do a poem, please get them to log on they log on the same way as this pressing the cold button gold, gold button and uh, the other thing i'd like to uh, flag up is teresa is doing a set um next next sunday together with a lot of uh, uh teachers from around the world storytelling teachers around the world the rest i could go on forever but I'll leave it at those two. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, uh, Gary, I can see you're putting up. So did you want to speak? Yeah, yeah. Every other Tuesday, uh, I think the last one's just gone, we do, uh, I, I run a thing called Zoom to the Moon, which is part of the Ladder to the Moon storytelling um, sessions that happen down here in Falmouth in Cornwall, but haven't happened since we had our first, our second, we had two meetings and then COVID hit. So, um so I run a I run a bi-monthly event on Zoom. I've put the connection in there. It's main it's mainly storytelling. So I, I appreciate a lot of people doing poetry, but it's mainly a storytelling thing. But that doesn't mean to say if you come along and you know if we've got we've got space, there's, there's room for everybody. Um, we've got a couple of regular tellers in in the space with us now. Jill and Colin both come along on a regular basis. Um, so yeah, I've put the details in into the um, chat box just there. Is that our Jill who's here? It is, Jill. Yeah. Yep. Oh, right. well, that's going to be a good night with you two there by yourselves anyway. So that's fine. And Colin oh, comes along as well frequently, sang a beautiful song for us at the week, uh, uh, this week just gone by. So, oh. Yeah. 
Yeah, brilliant. And when it's all back face to face again in Falmouth, which which venue are you? Cutty Sark. Are you in a Cutty Sark? Ah. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. It's surprising how my knowledge of Cornwall has grown since I was 17, particularly all the pubs. <laughs> <laughs> right. Has anybody else got anything they want to say? Oh, I see David. David, you unmute yourself. Uh, why I do me well again? When's the story round again? It's um, in two weeks from today. Okay. So it will be Sundays at six o'clock. Okay, that's so that's 20... not next Sunday. Yes, not that's next Sunday. It's, this, it's not next Sunday. It's the Sunday, the 29th of November at six o'clock UK time. Okay. Okay. Right. Mike, I would have stuck around and told a story, Louisa. but I got a quick tea. So I've got to go. And, I, I, yeah. Here, Gary. Nice to be in your company again. Nice to see you all. Bye. Bye. Are you awake? Yeah. Uh, Colin's got his hand up. Okay. Theresa first, then Colin. Yeah, I just want to say that um, I, that I'm actually going to be telling a story next week uh, at the, uh, the World Storytelling Cafe. It won't be poetry. It's actually a story about um, Bera, the Hag of Bera, an Irish story. Wow. Well, telling, John and I think telling stories is the easiest thing in the world to do, so that would be no problem for you. So. <laughs> <laughs> Colin, Irwin, you put your hand up. Uh, sorry, Mike. No, I was just waving uh, Gary off there. However... Oh, uh, were you? <laughs> uh, uh, you? You'd mentioned about your festival when... Hopefully, when when things get real again, um, when, when when do you envisage that uh, being? We're, we're yeah, expect. Had... I'm expecting to have our festival in Much Wenlock in Shropshire, on the 9th, tenth, and eleventh of July, twenty twenty one. Okay. Right. I we cancelled it this year. We've done a whole load of online. You, sometimes you have to look into your crystal ball, and I always quote nowadays who's. Um, Bob, who's the, the CEO of a brewery who sponsors our festival, and I think Mike, who's at the bottom here, will understand when I say this. When the COVID hit on the 23rd of March, he had a plan A. He went to plan B that afternoon, and by the end of that week, he was at plan Z, and he stopped call it, giving them names. So you just have to be completely pragmatic about it. But the big meetings on the decisions we have will be made in the next couple of weeks or so. But now they've announced the vaccine and there's other vaccines coming. We're quite confident. So I believe the call will be to have our festival, which is a field festival. And if you've heard of Hay on Why, well, we're closer to Glastonbury. OK. <laughs> I shall uh, blank that out in the calendar then. Yeah, get yourself over here, mate. Yeah, get yourself over. You go to Stranraer, then you're in Scotland, then you've got to turn right to get to England, OK? Just in case you don't know the way. <laughs> right. I believe that we've pretty much come to the end of the evening. Um, unless you particularly want to do anything, John, I'm going to call it. No, no, I, I'm quite happy to leave it to this wonderful group that we've had on tonight. I mean, it's just been a magnificent night. I want to thank him. Right. Okay, is David gone? I think he's just gone. Right. Okay, well, I'm going to call it Julio, and thank you very much.